the other Thirty Years' War, World War I and World War II. Part two, where we talk about the time period, about 1919 to about 1939, the period 20 years between the two great wars. And of course, my argument with this, which is why I call it uh, the other 30 years war, is that in many ways, when we step back and, you know, now we are 100 years later, it really is just one really big war, you know, with kind of a, a really big beginning. It tones down a little bit in between and then it gets really loud again, but it never quits really being a war. So the road to World War II begins with the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles. And as you might remember, uh, this is the treaty that Japan walked out of, so they're furious. Italy is part of it, but they get nothing out of it. Um, so they plunged into a Great Depression. And then Germany, the powerhouse of Europe, the economic powerhouse of Europe, and to, to a large degree, the entire world, they're blamed for the war. They deserve some of it. Um, they owe billions to everybody else, and they get into really what may be the worst depression any country has ever gone through. And with them in Italy in a depression, it kind of drags the rest of the world into a great depression. And so the answer is going to be that Japan's going to militarize and get very aggressive. Italy is going to turn fascist, and Germany is going to turn Nazi, which is another form of fascism. But before we get to those three, Let's talk about the fourth player that often gets forgotten about, and that's Russia. So let's talk a little bit about the development of Russia. Russia was always an interesting country. It's a massive country. It has a lot of potential, although it also has a lot of limitations, especially environmentally. It doesn't have quite the resources and the, uh, the agricultural potential that other places have. But still, it's always been the sleeping giant to some degree. But with just a few exceptions, has always struggled. Um, and, and, and the other thing about Russia, it, it has a, a weird identity. It, it's partly Asian, it's partly European, but it also has a strong Middle Eastern uh, influence, you know, because part of it does dip down into what we call the Middle East. It's had a huge Muslim influence over the centuries. The Ottoman Empire used to include some of Russia. If you look at Russian architecture, it's very Islamic. It's very Middle Eastern looking. So it's, it really is this kind of hodgepodge of a lot of influences. Um, and when we begin the 20th century, Russia is very much still struggling to make it. It's ruled at that point by uh, Tsar Nicholas II. Um, Tsar, of course, is Russia for the word Caesar, which basically means ruler, or king, or emperor. Um, by the way, this photograph uh, looks like you're looking at twins. This is actually King uh, George of England standing beside his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II. And when we're in class, I always ask students, can you tell which one's which? And uh, I mean, they really do look almost like twins, even though they're actually cousins. But you do see how closely related these rulers are. They're all related back to Queen Victoria. By the way, the King of England is on the right. It's actually Tsar Nicholas II is on the left there. Uh, Nicholas is, is a, a, just an odd guy, incredibly suspicious of anybody around him. Uh, according to legend, and you know, when you say that, it, that means it may not be true. Uh, he apparently had a lot of odd phobias, including the phobia of the number 17. And again, if you notice when he quit ruling, it happened to be in 1917. He disliked big cities, he, places like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, he thought uh, they were suspected. There was a lot of corruption. He felt like he was extreme moralist. Uh, he considered himself a, a very tight family man. Um, didn't believe in, in science much. He, he distrusted uh, the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. And so therefore he was definitely not an intellectual and distrusted people who considered themselves intellectuals. He also was a raging anti-Semite. And, you know, if you know anything about the history of Jews in Europe, you know that many of uh, European Jews uh, were kicked out of Russia in the early 1900s. In fact, many uh, Jewish Americans came here after being kicked out by Tsar Nicholas II. Um, his wife, Alexandra, 
uh, was actually German. She was extremely hardworking, uh, a grand, direct granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So they were cousins when they married, which was typical of the time. Um, absolutely not tolerant of non-churchgoers. They were, of course, part of the uh, Orthodox Church. And um, if anybody didn't belong to that church, incredibly intolerant. So she, too, uh, was also a raging anti-Semite. Now, to be fair, many, many people at this time were anti-Semitic, but these guys were pretty extreme. Um, both of them despised the peasants, which was the vast majority of Russia. Russia was still a very poor country, primarily. Um, and when they talked about the Russian people, they talked about them uh, in the way you talk about children and, and almost almost like pets they talk about when they rode around in their in their carriage through russia how the peasants uh would show childish joy when they met him um and and he, and he you know in the same way people who abuse their pets you know whip their dogs and they say oh my dog loves me uh you know he, he gets it you know they he talked about how the peasants loved to be whipped and tortured. They loved a strong hand. They only respected a strong uh, uh, a leader. And, um, and and it, one of his beliefs was that it's okay to torture people as much as you want to torture them, as long as they don't die. You know, you can't murder all your people, um, but but you could torture them. Now, pre-1861, it was very common for the government to just kill people, you know, for all kinds of purposes that, you know, they reformed in 1861 and now they only tortured their citizens. So you can already get the sense that this was not the greatest place to live if you were a Russian. So Nicholas II, like many rulers, was very arrogant, very aggressive. This is, again, this is a, a, a modern map, but again, this is, uh, you know, showing Russia. Uh, and again, you do get a sense of how large it is. As you can see, it dips into Middle East. It's definitely partly Asian. It's partly European. It goes from the Arctic Ocean all the way into, you know, the the Mediterranean, almost the Mediterranean Sea and, and the Black Sea. It's, you know, massive territory. And Nicholas II decided um, that it wanted to expand even further. And so it actually ends up getting into a war with Japan, which really is just off this map. You can see it says on the right Sea of Japan, and then there's Japan just outside of the, the picture. And they get into a war fighting uh, over land in uh, 1905, and Russia loses. I mean, this little tiny country of Japan beats uh, Russia. And, and we'll, we'll talk about Japan a little bit later. Japan um, really was only a modern nation for a few decades by this point. But then again, Japan had already fought against China in 1895 and won. Now here they are fighting the other major Asian power, Russia, and they win. Um, and of course, not only do the Russian people suffer from this war, um, but Russia itself uh, comes off as very weak and very corrupt. Um, and, and again, Russian people are getting to the point where they're tired of this and they're going to respond to this. So we get an event uh, that's known as Bloody Sunday. And this is an event that eventually evolves into what's sometimes called the First Russia Revolution, the Revolution of 1905. On January 22nd, 1905, there was a peasant protest at the Tsar's Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Um, and the Tsar basically, you know, he they want the Tsar to come out and know how much they're suffering and maybe he will help them. He sends out the soldiers and they gun down thousands of these poor peasants. They want to reform. Um, you know, they, they wanted to be heard. They wanted to have a, a say in, the, in their lives and they're just simply mowed down. And what it really reveals is that, you know, the, the government doesn't care about them. And this ends up causing waves of unrest and protest and violence. The other major sort of moment is a, a, an uprising on the battleship Potemkin. Uh, it's been made into a, a pretty uh, fascinating silent film in the 1920s. And, and in fact, I, I on Georgia View, I have a 
and I, maybe I'll put it in the description for those who might be watching this who aren't in my class. Um, I've had a couple of people say, oh, I actually listened to your lecture, so maybe I'll put it in the description as well. And that is a clip from Battleship Potemkin, a very famous clip, uh, a, 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 a thing known as the Odessa Steps Battle. Uh, most of what happens in the movie is actually not accurate, but it's incredible cinema that's been ripped off by many directors. In fact, I'm also going to put a clip from a movie called The Untouchables from the 80s that directly copies this movie. Anyway, um, the battleship Potemkin, uh, uh, part of the uh, Black Sea Fleet in the Russian Navy, um, they were um, already suffering from low morale, from losing to Japan and all the other issues going on in Russia. On June 27th, and they were, this is near Ukraine, uh, the men just finally decided we're not going to eat any more of this rotten food. Uh, the second in command threatened to shoot them if they didn't eat their food and they go back to their duties. Uh, ultimately, eight officers were killed because there was a mutiny that r raised up. Uh, and then the, the ship itself landed in Odessa. Um, and they raised a red flag and this was going to be a big labor strike. And, and really between Bloody Sunday and this event, we get into the again the Russia Revolution of 1905, labor strikes, riots, mutinies, and what ultimately happens is we do see on the surface a bunch of reforms. You know, in other words, the Tsar gives in, or at least appears to give in. Um, there is a constitution created again, going back to the American uh, model. You know, when the United States is the first country of the true constitution, this is, you know, this is what modern countries do. So they're going to have a constitutional monarchy. And of course, the constitution uh, is a limit on government. So this is going to limit the monarchy, you know, uh, which is what we see in the United Kingdom. Uh, although it doesn't really, as we'll see, uh, there's going to be a legislature, the Duma, um, so that people have at least some voice. Uh, and the problem is, um, that it, 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 it's all surface. The Duma only meets four times between 1906 and 1917. They, the, 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 they, when they do hold their meetings, uh, it's going to happen in St. Petersburg, but it really doesn't do anything. Uh, based on the Constitution, um, all laws had to be approved by the Tsar. So anything that the Duma did, the Tsar had to approve it. If he didn't approve it, it didn't happen. And it's not like where we have it, where a law is passed by Congress and then this president can veto it or sign it, because there's also the option for Congress to override a veto. The overriding part didn't happen here. So basically, this is still just a, a, a straightforward totalitarian personal rule by uh, the Tsar. They just kind of have this little pretend a uh, show parliament that doesn't really actually do anything and it takes a while before people begin to realize that th this this was a sham this did not work and of course then you get into world war one and um, for a lot of people in russia this was the last straw uh, most of the peasants were like why why do we want to fight this war uh, this is just a war for business. This is a war for empires. We're going to get nothing out of this. Nothing's going to change for us. Uh, and, and even the conduct of the war, it shows that the Russian leaders were inept. They, didn't, they clearly didn't care for people. Uh, and, and the peasants are beginning to rise up. Or we're almost seeing a Russia revolution of 1914. And so one of the things that Nicholas does is, you know, he kind of panics. So he personally, in 1915, went to the front himself to show solidarity with the people and that, you know, he's there with them. And it does kind of hold it together for a couple of more years. Um, by the way, um, you know, in the United States, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of debate of whether women should fight or not. Um, and, and of course, today we do have women on the front lines, although uh, still officially women, if we ever have a draft again, we won't be drafting women at this point. Um, and we kind of think we're very progressive because women you know, now are allowed to fight. But actually, Russia has been doing it uh, for, for decades. And in fact, there was, uh, you know, women units that fought in World War I. Um, and and the, the Women's Volunteer Detachment. I had a student several years ago wrote a fabulous research paper on this group. 
Anyway, um, the war, d d exactly what the fear was. It actually makes things just so much worse for the peasants. And what's interesting, Russia was fighting against Germany. They were on the side of what we call the allies. And, and actually, had they stayed in the war, uh, might have gotten some benefit out of it. But um, by 1917, the, you know, um, the Russia people have had it. So what we begin to see, it starts actually in February, but really takes off in March, and, and that is what's kind of known as the first of the Russian revolutions um, of 1917. Um, the, the, again, they rise up, they overthrow the czar, uh, a prime minister is put in place into this provisional government, this kind of basically like a temporary government as, you know, and the job of the provisional government basically was just to get, get Russia out of the war kind of get their act together and then they could look at creating a more permanent government and a guy named alexander kerensky is going to be in charge of this government what's really interesting is that eventually kerensky is kicked out and he ultimately became a historian um, in the united states and he taught at stanford university in california and um, i actually had a professor that that you know took a class with him and he, he said it's really interesting because a lot of students didn't know it, it, apparently and i think this is in like the 50s they didn't know who the guy was and they started talking about the russian revolution and somebody started arguing with him and he said you know that i was there i literally was <laughs> they're like oh anyway um so by September, Russia is officially a republic. In other words, the czar has stepped down. Republic means no king, no monarchy. And it seemed like, you know, Russia had a chance here. Um, again, this was not brutal. This was not, you know, this seemed to be a, 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 maybe a positive mood. Uh, but then in October, um, everything changed. Everything. Um, and that's where we talk about the second Russia Revolution of 1917, led by this guy in the photo, Vladimir Lenin, and we'll talk more about him in a second. This was a, a, a group known as the Bolsheviks took over. Bolsheviks means the majority. And that basically what this is now is the first of the ruling communist parties in Russia. And we'll talk about what is communism in just a moment. Their slogan was peace, land, and bread. These are the three things they're going to bring to the Russia people. They also become much more violent. Uh, the hope of the first revolution is gone. Um, this is why Kerensky leaves. He, he basically has to get out of there. And so the czar and his family are executed. And of course, uh, one of the reasons he does this is there is a lot of fear that others are going to come in and restore the czar. And because of communism, and we'll get it, like I said, we'll, we'll explain. If you don't know much about communism, we will learn about it in a second. But for a lot of countries, they saw that just the presence of a communist country, because Russia basically becomes the first nation that's communist, is seen as a threat to the capitalist system, uh, you know, which is what most of the world is using at that point. And so there's a lot of fear by Lenin and, and the communists, the Bolsheviks, that uh, other countries are going to come in. And as long as you have the czar, you can always restore this guy. So by killing him and his family, it makes a statement. And, of course, it, uh, it, it basically ends that line. And, of course, the family one day was gathered up and executed. And there's always been this, you know, some of you may know this, there's always been this story, uh, did one of the daughters survive, Anastasia, there's been, there's been cartoons about this, there's movies about it, novels about it. Um, she was 17, supposed to, again, going back to the 17, uh, when she was died, they died on the 17th, by the way. Um, she was the youngest daughter. And there have been a couple of people, in fact, actually 10 different people claim to be her. Uh, but there was a woman named Anna Anderson uh, in the United States. She lived until 1984. She claimed to be Anastasia. Uh, she, uh, she's not. She was an imposter. Uh, in fact, she was uh, 
a Polish factory worker that immigrated and then just pretended to be. Uh, actually, in the last few years, and I can't remember exactly how long ago, but in the 2000s and teens, they definitively proved that they actually found the remains of Anastasia and uh, using both dental records and DNA records. So we know for a fact she did not survive. One thing that a lot of people are not familiar with is that, you know, it wasn't just a communist revolution, that was it. Actually, there was a Russia civil war that lasted for nearly five years. You know, World War I ends, of course, in November of 1918, um, and the United States, Japan, uh, England, France, Greece basically stay in Europe. And this is, again, this is something that's almost completely forgotten about. And uh, they all got involved in the Russia Civil War against what was known as the White Army uh, versus the Red Army. And Red has always been associated with communism. And again, I'll explain that in a second. But so the Whites versus the Reds. And uh, most of the West uh, wanted the Whites, if you will, the White Army to win uh, as opposed to the Red Army. We had uh, about 8,000 soldiers fighting in Russia for a while. Uh, the Brits had 40,000 soldiers. The Greeks had 23,000. There were 2,000 French soldiers there. By 1920, most of, of the foreign soldiers, including the U.S., had left. Uh, it seemed to be a doomed proposition. Uh, but the, again, going back to this idea of, you know, no wars, this is, I mean, this, the Russian Revolution is very much part of World War One, and it's almost like World War One is still going at least until 1922, at least as far as Russia is concerned. So what is communism? What do we mean by this? So today, you know, when we talk about countries that are communist today, they really are very bear no real relation to the actual ideas of communism. Now, there's not to get into it too much, but I mean, there, there's been various philosophers and thinkers for centuries that have come up with different ideas that we might say are sort of communistic. Um, but to keep it simple, let's just talk about this guy, Karl Marx, um, and his ideas. And the ideas, again, that he had... Um, really bear little relation to communism in the 21st century. Today, there are still communist nations. There's not many, but there are some. Uh, officially, it's China, Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, and North Korea. Russia is, it's kind of hard to say exactly what Russia is at this point. They're definitely not communists, but, but they're not truly a democracy either. Um, and China is another one. If you you know if you talk to political scientists, sometimes sometimes they're called post-communists, but they are officially still a communist country. But of course, what these countries really are dictatorships. They're really closer to fascism than they are communism. So let's talk about what was communism supposed to be. So Karl Marx was uh, German and Jewish, he, but he but did most of his writing in, in in England, which is where he ultimately died. Um. And he, he worked on political science, he worked on philosophy, and he was a historian. And what he basically argued is that history is driven by class conflict. And what we mean by class is one's relationship to money, or, or as he would have said, the, your relationship to the means of production. You know, are you upper class? I mean, do you have, are you the elite? It's funny, we Americans, we don't like the word class because um, the moment you start saying class around then people start going, oh, you're what are you, a communist, a socialist? So it's funny, we like the term middle class. <laughs> we use that constantly. Every politician talks about the middle class, but we never say the upper class and lower classes or the elites and working classes. That that Especially the working class, that's always scary to say because that sounds very communist, but yet... If, you're, if you have a middle class, you've got to have people above and people below. So Karl Marx said that this is what drives history, is that those with the money, those with the power, uh, want to maintain that power. So they're, they're going to use various methods to keep the working class where they are. And as a historian, it is a useful tool. So what we can say is that there are Marxist historians. 
And then there are Marxian historians. Now, I myself am neither. However, some of the lectures I've given have a Marxian quality to them. The way I explain American slavery definitely has a Marxian um, flavor. A Marxist historian is somebody that absolutely believes what Karl Marx says and, and, and basically is a spouting Karl Marx's ideas through history, and there are plenty of them still out there. A Marxian, uh, and I'm not a Marxian, but but I do think it helps. I do think class conflict does explain a lot of things. Uh, the problem with Karl Marx as a historian is anytime a historian gives one explanation, what we call monocausal, this is why it happened. Because mm, history, I mean, even just any decision you make any day. In fact, you're listening to this lecture. Your decision to listen to this lecture at this moment probably was based on at least five things. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wide awake. I don't have anything else to do. I want a good grade. I want to graduate. Well, you know, there's never one reason we do anything. So when a historian starts saying, this is it, I'm very suspicious. So I, I don't think he's a good historian, but I think he does. I, I think the idea of looking at class is one of the many things that we can do in history. And I think it, I think he has contributed to history by bringing up class. I, I, that definitely is important. Um, but but, you know, so the Marxian viewpoint can be useful, um, but a Marxist viewpoint is not. So what he argued and again, remember, he's writing in the mid 1800s. This is the height of the Industrial Revolution in England, and it was very ugly in England. So, I mean, you do see factory workers, for instance, what he referred to as the bourgeoisie, the capitalist. Bourgeois, by the way, originally goes, it's, it's French, it basically means a walled city. Um, you know, we talk about Pittsburgh, a burg. In Scotland, they would call it a borough, like Edinburgh. Um, but a burg really originally was a walled city, and later a burg basically just means a town. And so this is just the French for the same thing, a bourgeoisie, those who live in the walled city, those with the money, you know, versus the proletariat, those without property, the workers. And, uh, you know, you can hear some of that in our politics today a little bit. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about the one percenters versus everybody else, for instance. Um, so he's writing during the time, especially in England, where, the, you know, if you think about Charles Dickens novels and, you know, the stories of evil factory workers absolutely exploiting people who are unbelievably poor. So I mean, we got to keep in mind that his ideas were coming out of this time period. And all he, I mean, again, he's just a historian and a political scientist. He's just going, I wonder how I can make things better. Hmm. Let me look at history and see, uh, can we provide answers for the future? Which, by the way, another problem. Historians, we have no answers for the future. We only have answers for the past. But this is, you know, basically what he would argue capitalism is. You have, you know, the money at the top, and then you have, you know, uh, the elites at the top, the monarchs, the presidents, the prime ministers. So it says capitalism, you know, we rule you, and then you have the churches, we fool you, and then you have the military, we shoot at you, and then you have the middle class, we eat for you, and then at the bottom are the proletariat. We work for all, we feed all. And of course, what Marx says is it should be just the opposite. Those who do all the work, those who do, you know, make all, grow all the food and make all the money should actually enjoy it. Um, so this is kind of at the core uh, what we mean by, you know, his, his problem with capitalism, as, at least as practiced in the 1800s. So, What's interesting is he, he's trying to come up with answers. He writes uh, a couple of books, one, uh, The Communist Manifesto, which is basically just a poorly written history of, of, of how class conflict has driven the world. Um, by the way, this is his uh, tombstone in a Highgate Cemetery in, um, in London. Ironically, because there's so many visitors that want to see it, you actually have to pay <laughs> to see it. So I love that, you know, uh, you know this profit-driven capitalist system is, what, is the only way you can see a communist leader. Um, 
most people, again, don't really know much about Karl Marx. Karl Marx was not some evil person that wanted to take rule the world and, and be horrible. Um, I, I, I think he was, you know, at heart, a decent guy, even though I totally think he was wrong, of course, like most people do. Um, but again, I think Karl Marx is often held up as, you know, an evil person, which I don't think is fair to him. Um, so he's really vague on what he thinks is happening. He never really quite tells you how to get to the goal and what exactly is the goal. But what he envisioned was, wouldn't it be great if one day no one is hungry, no one is poor, we don't have these silly wars over, you know, money and oil, and we just live peacefully together and we live as equals. I mean, it's a beautiful idea. Some people have have described it as almost a Christian idea where all God's children are all equal in God's eyes. Um, it almost sounds very American in some ways. All men are created equal. We should all be free. You know, I mean, as a pure idea, it is a beautiful idea. Um, in fact, one of the clips I'm going to put as part of this video is, of course, uh, you know, the song by John Lennon, the song Imagine, which, of course, uh, recently a bunch of celebrities <laughs> tried to sing and it didn't go very well. Um, but, you know, imagine all the people living together in peace. Imagine no countries, no one to kill or die for. Uh, of course, John Lennon, a former Beatle, uh, definitely wasn't a communist. Um, but it is a communist song. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, he is he's basically just rephrasing Karl Marx. But of course, John Lennon, one of the richest entertainers, was purely a capitalist at heart. Um, but it is a beautiful idea. Um, now, one of the problems I think a lot of people, including Americans, have had with it, other than, you know, you know, nobody likes to be poor, but everybody wants to be rich, and the, you know, and everybody can't be rich. So this idea of everybody being equal, you know, I think a lot of people see that as, wait a minute, I, I want to be rich. But the, I think one of the big issues a lot of people have with Karl Marx is the fact that he does have uh, an issue with religion. You know, part of the communist ideal is there is no religion. There is no God. You know, if you remember on the graph, uh, the, the, the illustration a moment ago, it showed the priests and it says, we fool you. And, you know, as the famous phrase is, religion is the opiate, you know, opium, drug. Uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. Now, if you read the entire quote, he does, he's not, he gets why people are religious. You know, he would, he, he was not like, oh, you're a bunch of idiots. His idea was, you know, you're living the awful life and religion gives you hope, you know, but what he wanted is to say, look, you know, it is a fairy tale, you know, uh, that you can have utopia here on earth. You don't have to wait till the afterlife. Um, you know, he would say, you know, all these politicians and kings will tell you it's okay. You're, you're poor because one day you'll die and you'll have a wonderful time in heaven. And they're just lying to you. Because if they really believe that, they'd give up the money. But notice the people with money never give it up because they know that, you know. So, but but that anti-religion aspect, obvious, in fact, I guarantee every listener to this is probably like, hmm, I don't like that. So that's always been one, of, this is one of the reasons churches often go after Karl Marx. And, you know, obviously from a religious viewpoint, that is problematic. But the, the ultimate goal really isn't necessarily ugly, you know, even though it, it, it is not feasible. And in and, and, and practice, it's awful as you'll see in a moment. But the goal, and, and, and Karl Marx died long before anybody even tried to become, it was, again, it was just a philosophy. Uh, and he didn't really know how to do this. You know, he never tells you how to go from here to there. He just says, this sucks, and down the road would be great. That in-between part, he, he doesn't know how to do that. Uh, and he does acknowledge that the, probably to get to utopia, uh, it's going to be ugly and it's going to require war and violence and maybe a dictator. And then ultimately we'll get there. So a couple of things that he did believe it, it has to happen in a developed nation, an advanced nation, a nation where people are educated, where, where there's already uh, factories and technology. It can't just happen anywhere. Um, in fact, his hope was the United States. He loved the U.S., and he said, he said, the U.S. is already halfway there. You know, in the, in the declaration, it says all men are created equal. Um, of course, he was thrilled with the, you know, the ending of slavery in the United States. And he thought, you know, that uh, he predicted the United States is where the communist revolution is going to happen. Um, not Russia. 
that Russia would be the last country on his list, a backward uh, peasant uh, agricultural country, you know. So uh, so if he was alive today, he'd be like, oh, no wonder it didn't work because it was in Russia where it began or China or Cuba. The other thing that he argued is that it can't just be one country. It only works if everybody is communist the whole world which does get into that whole idea of global domination so if you're the leader of the communists then obviously you're going to be a global leader um and and so to be a good communist i think this is another part that makes it quite scary is to be a good communist because the, the way marx argued he says there will be a revolution which another sign that he was a bad historian nothing is inevitable we again we don't predict the future but he says it's going to happen the people will rise up and take over but a good communist is going to make that happen sooner that's your job is to constantly try to to start the revolution and again i think that's another part that that's very distasteful about a, a true communist is that they're always trying to convert you they're always trying to get you to overthrow your government you know um I and mean, this is why there were things like the red scare because if people really were communists then that means they are trying to overthrow the government you know uh, anyway um it, it doesn't really explain how to do this it, it, it is you know and then he dies and his books you know people read them and and oh but one other thing is nowadays we often distinguish between communism and socialism um and i mean there are distinctions you know and, and like the united states obviously is not a socialist country but but there are aspects of socialism that we do you know socialism is where the government runs an industry and we have public schools and we have public police forces and public armies and you know public firefighters so it's all could be private um but obviously, as we have seen in the 20th century, when countries truly are socialist or truly are communist, it doesn't seem to work. Um, anyway, but, but Marx often used socialism and communism because he invented these ideas. So, but he kind of uses them interchangeably. And it's really not till you get into the 20th century that people start making distinctions between communism and socialism. To him, it's all just one big, very vague thing. He, basically, it was just, wouldn't it be great if we were all equal? Yeah, that'd be cool. And that's it. Okay, so then you get into people like Vladimir Lenin, the guy who led the October 7, 1917 Russia Revolution and ultimately was in charge of Russia until his death in 1924. He had a very different viewpoint. I mean, he took Marx's ideas and then he tweaked them. This is something else again, like Marx said, and he said nobody, he would have said if he was alive, nobody actually did Marxism. And he's right. But then again, we would think you could counter with, you didn't know what Marxism exactly was either. But anyway, uh, Lenin, uh, born uh, also uh, Jewish, he, and the reason I keep mentioning that is because the Nazis in Germany uh, are going to use communism as uh, an excuse to go after Jewish peoples. Because they see this is a Jewish plot to take over the world. It, I mean, it's just a coincidence that Marx and Lenin were both Jewish. It really doesn't mean, you know, of course mean anything, but that is how Hitler, so that's why I keep bringing that up. So um, setting up Hitler, basically. Okay, so Lenin uh, it was, was a, a son of two teachers. He was uh, born on the Volga River. His brother had been at one point killed by the Tsar because he was involved in politics and Lenin got involved in politics. So he ends up leading the revolution against the provisional government by Kerensky. Now, he argued that, you know, again, Marx is talking about a people's revolution, the people rising up. He said, Lenin said, no, 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 no. Um, it, it can't just be everybody. You know, that's silly. It has to be like a vanguard par party, a party of those, you know, th there are some people in a society that are smarter and, you know, and, and they're more educated and they know how to rule and those should lead the people. So, uh, you know, instead of a, a revolution from below, it's going to be more of a revolution from above. I mean, he very much was an elitist, incredibly secretive, uh, believes in strict discipline. Um, and the reason he thought it should be Russia, other than he is Russian, so obviously he, he wants it in Russia, um, but he thought, well, no, no, it, 
Marx is wrong. It, 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 it will never work in a place like America at first because they're so blinded by their by their money and by their all that stuff that, that it, it's, it's just going to be too difficult to break in. What we need is a weak link. And Russia was very vaguely capitalist. So they're the weakest link. And if we can break into Russia, you know, break that link, if you will, and then establish this utopian government, then everybody else will follow. So, you know, in other words, to crack into this capitalist world, you have to find the window that you can break the weak link. And he said, Russia is that weak link, if you will. Um, and again, he eventually sets himself up as the leader of Russia, and he argued that, you know, we'll start here and it'll spread elsewhere. Something else that people do forget about is that there were attempts at communist revolutions throughout the early 1920s. You know, because again, in the World War One, I, I mean, it was destructive for so many people, and there was a lot of questioning of capitalism and imperialism. And so in places like China, Netherlands, Finland, Germany, Bavaria, Mongolia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Italy, we see attempts at communist revolutions. They all failed. Even the United States sees a rise of a communist party in 1918 and 1919. Um, but, you know, none of this takes off. And so this idea that Russia was going to lead the way clearly did not work. When Lenin died uh, of a stroke in 1924, uh, he didn't set up, you know, because basically this was, he, I mean, he was almost a dictator in, in a way. And he didn't really have his successor set up because he wasn't thinking about who comes after me. Uh, somebody that had helped him was a guy named Leon Trotsky, who had been in charge of the army for a while. He um, briefly kind of uh, was in charge, but... A guy named Joseph Stalin, who was kind of the henchman, if you will, for for Lenin, you know, his his the guy that you know kind of did all the dirty work. He sort of pushed himself in place and pushed out Trotsky. Uh, Trotsky eventually f made his way, uh, you know, f you know, went into hiding, and then at one point was in Mexico City and Stalin, because Stalin had people looking all over the world for him, and eventually had him murdered in Mexico City. So Joseph Stalin ends up uh, becoming in charge, and uh, he has a very different viewpoint um, of how to rule. So he didn't take the idea of, you know, I mean, Marx's idea is, is international, it has to be worldwide. Lenin tweaks that a little bit. He says, okay, we're going to start in Russia, but eventually it will spread everywhere else, and all these other countries will just kind of join us. Stalin's like, no, uh, first off, we're not going to worry about the rest of the world. You know, we're not going to constantly try to, what, what might be called, export the revolution. We're going to have socialism in one nation, and then maybe that one nation, Russia, will, might take over the world. But they will all just be part of Russia is ultimately the goal here. Um, so he takes a lot of Stalin's, excuse me, Lenin's ideas and begins to put them in place. So uh, Lenin has started some of this and Stalin you know, kind of took it further. And this idea of, again, kind of going back to this idea of a vanguard party, if you will, the elites. And, and again, I, I, I guess I need to address this. I mean, that's part of the problem with all of this is that, you know, communism all are equal. But of course, you have to have somebody in charge, which means there's already inherent inequality. Um, so you have these elites, this vanguard party, if you will, that are really kind of running everything. And so this idea of state planning, government planning of everything. And um, so, for instance, collective agriculture. And um, and you also have these five-year plans. Uh, this actually started under Lenin, and every five years they would have a new plan. This is what we're going to do over these next five years. Um and, and it basically is a kind of what we might call state capitalism, because there was this art, you know, there was this recognition that we do have to have money to be able to do things, but we're going to have the government run it instead of having the people run it. So therefore, individuals don't get wealthy at the expense of the workers, if you will. Um, 
So these five-year plans were absolutely a disaster because, again, the way capitalism works is that it is driven by the market. It's driven by consumers. You also have to have innovation. The people have to be able to come up with ideas and then and then be able to change you know, and adjust. And if you have these five-year plans, you have to stick to the plan. You can't adjust. There's no innovation. And also there's no incentive. Um, you know, every, everyone's just doing, you know, what, what they're told to do. And this collective agriculture, what Stalin and, and the government did is they started going, okay, uh, these people over here who are making shoes, we're going to shift those people 500 miles away. and You guys are going to start growing potatoes. And these people over here who are working in this factory, we're going to ship you a thousand miles away. And now you're going to start growing corn or something. And, you know, we're going to, again, this is all about state planning and we're going to make people do these jobs. And what ultimately happens is it's massive famine. In 1932 and 1933, there was a the great famine. Uh, over 8 million people starved in that one year. Uh, for uh, almost 5 million in the Ukraine alone. Uh, which is why even today there is so much tension between the Ukraine peoples and Russia. And, you know, anyway, um, he also, you know, as people resist or don't do what they're supposed to do, there's a lot of purges. For instance, in 1937, almost a million people were executed by being shot in the back of the head. Um, there were over two million people arrested. Uh, over three million people were shifted, deported up to Siberia, uh, which is in, you know, very north Russia, basically in the Arctic. Uh, and, and, and these gulags were set up where about 14 million people would be basically concentration camps that imprisoned about 14 million people. Over 2 million would ultimately die in these gulags. In other words, Stalin is one of the worst leaders we've ever seen. Uh, we talk about Hitler and he should be talked about and we're going to talk about him. Uh, but we forget about people like Mao Zedong, which was the communist leader of China. They're not in power yet. They won't be in power until after World War II. Uh, but we forget about Stalin, where over 20 million Russians die under Stalin. And that doesn't include, by the way, the 20 million Russians who die in World War II. So we are talking, you know, true state terror. This, this is, you know, and it's almost forgotten about today, I think. Um, unless you're unless you're a student of history. So that's where Russia is. Uh, Russia, again, a very brutal government, a, a government that is ready to take over the world, basically, to make everybody communist under Russia rule. So they're prone. They're ready for war, basically. And again, what we're seeing in Russia throughout this period is constant fighting between the people and the Russian government. Then in the 20s, we get. Let's talk about Italy. We get something known as fascism and led by a guy named Benito Mussolini. So Italy at the end of World War I, um, they were part of the Supreme Council, those four countries along with France, England, and the United States, but they come out of this with nothing. Uh, there was a prime minister, uh, basically you're talking about somebody who's in charge of the parliament, Luigi Facta, but he served of course under the king, King Victor Emmanuel who was king from 1900 all the way to 1946, even though I'm not going to talk about him anymore. Uh, there was always a king of Italy, which is interesting. Uh, I don't think he gets as much blame as he should for what's going to happen in Italy. But the real player here is Benito Mussolini, uh, who actually started out as a socialist, uh, very lefty. I mean, he was a, a, a fan of Marx and, and, and uh, even, you know, it was basically a, another version of Vladimir Lenin. He was a teacher for a while, but he also was a newspaper editor. He tried to write some novels. Um, and then World War I changes him. He becomes, you know, a very different person and um, be begins to feel that um, that socialism could work but only if it's run specifically by the government, which sounds a little bit like what Lenin and Stalin are doing, but not quite. But basically this idea of nationalism. And if you remember nationalism, it's this idea that 
that the everything about the nation comes first. There's, there's no individual rights. It's all about the nation and that the nation should be in charge. So it's, so it's this weird kind of right wing version of socialism, which is why the Nazis are the nationalist socialists. Um, and really this idea of fascism was born initially on March 23rd of 1919. Mussolini led uh, about a hundred veterans and workers and they declared that they were going to declare war against the socialists because socialists opposed nationalism. So they wanted nationalist socialism. Uh, they were allow women to vote, uh, eight hours, install an eight hour workday, but you're not working for yourself, you're working for the good of the nation. And of course, Italy is plunged into a massive depression, and that's when revolutions happen. This is why the American Revolution is so weird, because the colonists actually were doing pretty good, but most revolutions happen when people are absolutely starving. In October of 1922, uh, Mussolini leads a march on Rome, the, lead, the head of, you know, the capital of Italy. And uh, the king uh, decides, hmm, I could fight them, they may uh, win and I'm out of power, or I could abandon the prime minister and make a deal with Mussolini. And that's exactly what the king does. And so he basically says, you Mussolini, you are the new prime minister. Have, do what you will. As long as I stay king, you can do whatever you want. And that's exactly what he did. So the, the government that he creates, and again, this is what was declared in 1919, would be called fascism. This is really the one form of government that was created specifically in the 20th century. Because even Marx, uh, you know, he, communism and socialism are, are created in the 19th century, and then they go into place in the 20th century. But this is the, the only political system that's truly 20th century. And hopefully it'll stay in the 20th century, not, not follow us into the 21st. So it comes from the Latin word for fascies. And a, a fascist was this symbolic weapon uh, that would be carried around in parades and such. So you have an ax, basically, and you have these rods that are bundled together to make it even stronger. So this idea of strength and unity, if you will, th that we're stronger together. And what's interesting is that before 1919, Fascism was always seen as kind of a, a liberal, uh, and I don't mean, you know, I, terms like liberal and conservative, I hate because they, they kind of mean something different, but it was, very, I guess, a better way to say it would be kind of left wing. Uh, some of you might get mad for me for saying this, but I mean, the United States is kind of the idea, left wing meaning power to the people, right wing meaning, truly right wing means power to the elites. Now in the United States, it, it's different. <laughs> I don't want to get into that. Uh, but 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 in the classical sense, that's what we mean by left wing or right wing. So ultimate right wing would be a king, a dictator. Uh, ultimate left wing would be all the powers and the people. So the United States has always been, you know, in, in a way traditionally kind of left wing because it's the government is us. We are the government, the power to the people. And fascists have always represented that, you know, unity and strength, a United States, for instance. If you think of the the seal. Uh, with the eagle, he's the eagle is clutching on one hand uh, a, a sign of peace, the olive branch, but on the other hand, the arrows, you know, 13 arrows bundled together, representing the United States. Um, and the mercury dime, you, know, you can see it on the right, that, that's uh, an early version of the American dime. On the back of it, which is on the left there, was actually a fascist. Uh, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, with the olive branch behind it, you know, uh, representing the United States. And in fact, um, American symbols are constantly full of fascists. Again, before fascism meant what it does in the 20s, you know, this is when it just meant power to the people. And so uh, I never thought about this growing up, you know, you go to the Lincoln Memorial, I think I always thought they were books. But if you notice, it's two fascists that his hands are resting on. And of course, it represents the Confederacy and the United States and, and the fact that Lincoln held the North and South together as one big fascist. And here, you know, lots of our architecture has fascists on them. And of course, here's Abraham Lincoln leaning on a fascist, representing again the 13 colonies, the United States. But it changed with Mussolini, and nowadays fascism is considered kind of the ultimate right-wing uh, political system. 
So it, it does get a little bit difficult to, to say exactly what fascism is. It's really kind of a combo of a lot of things, and 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 and, and, and you kind of have to have all of this for it to be fascist. Uh, Mussolini is the first fascist leader. Adolf Hitler, who idolized Mussolini, will kind of be the second fascist leader. We have people like Franco in Spain in the 1930s. Uh, nowadays, I think we would call it more of a totalitarian dictatorship. Somebody like uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq was a fascist. I would argue Putin's pretty much a fascist today in Russia. Um, Fidel Castro was sort of a left-wing fascist in Cuba to some degree. So these are some of the aspects of it. And again, you can see things coming from already in our class that we've talked about. One aspect of it is this sense of racial and ethnic purity. Um, again, coming out of germ theory. Germ theory, you know, as applied to society is that you have a pure people and then you have these foreign germs, if you will, these foreign elements coming in and ruining uh, our society. That's why I mean by germ theory here. And of course, it's what we tend to call that a social Darwinism, whether you're talking about kind of cultural or truly racial, you know, that good genes versus bad genes, eugenics, in other words. There's also the sense, um, and it is a very powerful political tool, this idea of righting perceived wrongs. You know, usually it's another group of people. Those people did us wrong. And if you send me the power, I will avenge us. I mean, Adolf Hitler will do this, for instance, against the Jews. The Jews ruined us. I will avenge us. We will right those wrongs. And it's a powerful, nobody ever wants to admit they're wrong. And whenever you have something bad happen to you, you want somebody to blame. And this is why it's worked so well. Um, and lots of politicians do this. But again, when you mix this with social Darwinism, then it gets, this is what can create genocide. On top of that, this idea is nationalism. And that's the belief that your country is better than everybody else and everybody should be following you. But nationalism in one leader. And this is where we get into the dictator part. Um, you know, that the leader, whether it's Mussolini or Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein, it's all about that one leader, a fatherland. I am your father. I, I, everything is about me. And if you think about when you think of people like Hitler, it's it, his face plastered everywhere. Everything is about the glory of Hitler because Hitler represents Germany. So it's nationalism and one leader. It also tends to be anti-socialist because socialism is about everyone being equal, even though it has aspects of socialism. In other words, the government running everything, but the government running everything is really one person running everything. Socialism is we're all equal. We're all together. Uh, you know, we're, we, we all matter. And it's like, no, we all don't matter. Only the leader matters. Only the country matters. You don't matter. The country matters. It's also anti-capitalist. Capitalism is about individuality and it's about competition and, and no, 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 no. Because uh, again, that one leader, Mussolini, Hitler, they want to be in charge of the companies. It's all about them, not about these individual companies. Uh, it is also very violent. Uh, it is a system forced. It may be voted in initially, but it ultimately is a system that is forced on people and it maintains its legitimacy through the use of terrorism and violence. And again, it is totalitarian, meaning uh, it is ultimate. It is all encompassing. You know, state meaning in this case, meaning government, government rights trump any individual rights. You're you don't matter. The country matters. Um, and so you better get yourself in line that whatever you do and think and say is, again, all about making the leader, making the country more powerful. So, again, there's you, you have to kind of mix all of this together to be truly fascist. And like I said, today we tend to we, we tend to think of a military or totalitarian dictatorship. We don't tend to use the word fascism quite as much anymore. And, you know, I, I, I talked about how it's, you know, this one charismatic leader, sometimes that's referred to as a cult of personality. Um, and it is very tempting. You know, you know, you look at Mussolini here or you think of Adolf Hitler, you think, how could anybody follow that person? 
I'm going to be honest. Sometimes when I see these the political conventions in America, and I see you know Democratic conventions and the Republican conventions, and I see Trump or Obama or Bush or Clinton, and I see people chanting their names and their pictures, and I I don't think they're fascists, but I do think we could slip that way pretty easily, you know, because uh, humans do tend to like their celebrities, and 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 you know it, it is. It, it, it's it's very intoxicating. It, it's very seductive, and I, I you know, and, and I, I think we're always at risk. But of course, we look at Mussolini or we look at Hitler. And we think all oh, these guys are awful people. But of course, the people following them, the Italians, the Germans, they thought they were wonderful people. They thought they were wonderful people. That they were decent people fighting for them. It's only now, looking back, we go, oh my God, these people are awful. Again, that that's what's so scary, and I think you know we have to be careful of that sometimes. And and I have to, I'm going to be honest, as with social media and and and, and modern media and stuff, I and, and and our love of celebrity in America, I actually personally think the United States is very prone one day maybe to having a fascist leader. Um, I, as a historian, I I do see trends moving that direction sometimes. So anyway, but we call that a cult of personality, and there's a lot of focus on on symbols and and uniforms and 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 uh, propaganda and and you know I, I mean you know if you're an actor, these guys are always the most fun to play because you know they have the cool uniforms and the cool guns and you know and and I mean you think of something like Star Wars. You know, I mean, the, the, the Darth Vader and the Stormtroopers, I mean, when I was a kid, I loved them because they had this, they had a cool image. Well, George Lucas based them on the Nazis. And of course, the Nazis based everything they did on what Mussolini did. So there was this, so they, you know, I, I used the term seductive a moment ago. That's not an accident. You know, the, you know these guys, they wanted to be appealing. Uh, to the especially the people who were angry and poor and wanted revenge. I mean, again, I don't think Mussolini could have rose up at any other time. Uh, he wrote, he came just at the right time, if you will. Okay, so that's Mussolini. Italy itself uh, really won't be a major player once we get past about the mid 30s, but they set the tone that countries like Spain and of course Germany and then later countries are going to emulate. Then we get into Japan. Um, the big event in 1931 was a, a militarized Japan. In other words, the military takes over the government. Uh, they become a totalitarian government too. They invade Manchuria, which is this area that it's always, sometimes it's independent, sometimes it's been part of China, it's also been parts of, of Russia, but they invade Manchuria. And again, if you remember World War I, um, the Versailles Treaty, part of what it was supposed to do was prevent countries from invading other countries. And of course, we're supposed to have a League of Nations that prevents all of this. And 1931 showed that was a joke. That was not going to happen. So let's talk a little bit about Japan just for a moment. We haven't really mentioned them much. So you can see this is a, a, a modern map of Asia. Um, and you can see Japan there on the right, a series of islands. Um, Japan was never a major power really until the 20th century. Um, Japan is, has a very strange relationship with its neighbors, especially with China. Um, even today, there's a lot of hatred of China and Japan, even a lot of racism towards China. Um, and part of that is, I think, because if you look at the, the deep history of Asia, uh, there were initial peoples that lived in Japan, uh, people like the Ainu, but most of the people of Japan today genetically come from China. You know, really biologically, they're exactly the same people. Uh, even the Japanese language, even though it's, it's functionally quite different, but the characters of Japan, uh, again, they use them differently than China, but the actual characters are borrowed directly from the, the Chinese language. So so it's almost like Japan is, is, is a child of China. And I think they have culturally, historically, have tried to, to deny that connection ever since. But China was almost always kind of the major power in Asia and often dominated and, and ruled over Japan and invaded Japan. And there was lots of anger over that. Um, also, in the 15 and early 1600s, Europe began to colonize the world. They, like the Dutch, went into Japan, and, and 
Uh, ultimately, Japan in the 1600s began to close its borders. It, it, it closed itself off from the rest of the world to kind of protect itself. And, and it wouldn't trade with people. And, and so in 1850s, Japan was almost identical to what it was 200 years earlier. Very little innovation, no modern science, no modern technology. It really was this little time capsule. But in the 1850s, that changed. Um, Japan was, if you will, opened up. But it was opened up not by an Asian country or a European country, but by the United States. So the United States by the mid 1800s, I know it's a horrible map here, but the United States was already beginning to trade a lot with Australia and China. You know, we, we had a, a pretty big trade going on. We were also starting to buy islands throughout the Pacific and we would continue to do that long even after the Civil War. You know, we're gonna buy Alaska, we're gonna get Hawaii in 1898, we're gonna get all these islands. We start basically building almost an empire in the Pacific. And we, so we need places to stop and refuel and Japan was right there Japan had all these people we wanted to trade with them we also they had coal there we wanted to refuel there um, and Japan was refusing to to meet with our ships uh, and our people and a lot of our ships would 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 sometimes crash into Japan Japan would take the people and wouldn't let them go because they had closed borders. Basically, it's you're here, you're not going away. So the United States decided, look, Japan can't keep doing that. We want to trade with them. So United States sent this guy, Commodore Matthew Perry, to, again, open up Japan. So uh, in 1853 and 1854, um, Matthew Perry arrives to for diplomatic relations. The reason I have it in quotes and, and is, is because he really forced them open because he shows up with a couple of gunships. This is known as gunboat diplomacy. It's like if I if I say, can I borrow some money, but I got a gun pointed at your head? Can I borrow some money? You're going to give me your money. <laughs> you know? So he kind of forced them open, which, you know, Japan today, um, there's still resentment over that. Um, and of course, uh, with the opening of Japan, we continue to buy all these islands and Japan realizes they have a choice. Um, they, they can kind of reject this, but th by this point they realize that the modern world is encroaching on them no matter what they do, or they can join. So Japan joins, they basically decide to beat us at our own game. So throughout the late 1800s and early 20th century, we see a period of what's known as massive westernization. For instance, baseball is still a huge sport in Japan. Uh, they adopt an American sport of baseball. Uh, they begin to dress like Americans. Um, they begin to adopt uh, American culture and Western culture. They try to become basically a Western nation. They get very aggressive of this. And, and this is, Japan has always been very proud of, of, of this. Japan uh, traditionally has always said, we don't necessarily invent things. We don't necessarily, you know, come up with new ideas. But what we do in Japan is we take what other people do, we adopt it, and we just make it better. And again, one of the we can see that in the language. They they use a lot of what we call loan words, like anime, which comes from the English for animation. You know, so they take our animation and they change it, they make it their own. And we see this over. They've done it with baseball. They you know, um, so the idea is we're, we're going to join the West and then we're going to beat the West. We're going to do even better. So they build factories. They they begin to build up an incredible navy, an incredible military. Uh, again, 1895, they 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 go to war with China and win. 1905, they go to war with Russia and they win. Um, they are seen as a major power by the time of World War One. These are a couple of drawings. I, I love these. A little sketches from 1928 showing, again, Japan it was a modern nation with modern transportation, uh, modern buildings, skyscrapers. And you might think that's not a very big skyscraper, but if, again, if you read the uh, the text at the bottom because of, uh, of, of uh, earthquake activity, they, they couldn't build too many very tall buildings. Um, but nonetheless, they are a modern nation by the 1920s. And they've always been ruled by an emperor in the 20th century, is Emperor Hirohito. Um, but Hirohito agreed uh, to, and it kind of innovated the idea of becoming a militarized. In other words, with the military, 
uh, becomes in charge, and he's going to be the head of it, um, along with General Tojo. Basically, this is kind of their own version of fascism. It's not exactly fascism, but it pretty much is. And they do talk about racial purity and racial superiority. Uh, it, it is, again, kind of an Eastern version of fascism. It is really kind of a simplistic way of describing what's going on in Japan in the late 1920s. Um, and this is, of course, the, 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 the nationalist flag of Japan. It's the rising sun. Um, but this becomes, they, they become a nationalist country, uh, militarized. And the traditional religion of Japan has been Shintoism, this polytheistic religion. This is a, a Tori. Uh, basically, it's a gateway, a spiritual gateway to a temple. Um, it's always been kind of a symbol of Japan. Uh, but Shintoism sort of gets taken over by the government. And it becomes this nationalist religion with the emperor, a god himself, in charge of this religion. At the end of the war, uh, when the United States defeated Japan, one of the first things the emperor had to do was publicly announce that he is not a god. There's a lot of debate. How much did J Japanese people actually believe that? And, and there's a lot of debate. Did they really think he was a god? Probably not. But they definitely thought, thought of him as, in the same way people thought of Mussolini or Hitler, they thought of him as the absolute ruler and everything they did was to make him more powerful. So kids were being raised in the 20s and 30s to be soldiers, to fight for the glory of Japan at the expense of everything else. It was becoming a totalitarian government. And in fact, the emperor has his own flag, you know, and it's, uh, the emperor as embodiment in the sun itself. And so by, you know, again, 1931, uh, you, you basically have a leader that's very similar to Mussolini or Hitler. Uh, today it's very traditional to say, oh, the emperor didn't really have any power. He didn't really, do, uh, it's absolutely not true. And, but even today, 2020, Hirohito still doesn't get listed uh, in, in sort of that rogues gallery of 20th century villains like we do Stalin and Hitler and Mussolini and Saddam Hussein, but he absolutely should be there. So they decide to invade Manchuria, uh, an independent nation, a member of the League of Nations. And the League of Nations does indeed um, criticize them for this, but at the same time doesn't do anything because nobody wants to go to war. And everyone else is watching. Wait a minute. Nobody did anything to Japan. Hmm. By the way, Japan did this by, they, they did a little bit of a, a a conspiracy. Conspiracy theories love to say 9-11 wasn't true. So it's, it's, you know, all of those modern day conspiracy theories kind of started with this. Um, there was an act of terrorism on a Japanese train. Uh, by this point, Japan controlled Korea. And so a, tr a train from Korea into Manchuria was blown up on the bridge. And Japan said, oh, Manchurian terrorists did this, so we're going to invade Manchuria. Well, we now know that Japan did that themselves. They faked it as an excuse to go into Manchuria because they were worried that otherwise the League of Nations would prevent them. Everybody knew it was a sham. Nobody believed it. But yet, at the same time, nobody stopped them. And Italy and Germany is paying attention to this. Hmm, nobody stopped them. Then we get the rise of fascism in Germany itself and the rise of Hitler uh, to leader of Germany. So Germany absolutely suffered at the end of World War I, probably the worst depression anywhere, to the point that you know money was almost completely worthless. You know, this amount of money might get you a loaf of bread, which meant people just quit dealing with money for a while. And this is the world Adolf Hitler grew up in. Uh, born in 1899. He's actually Austrian. Uh, Austria and Germany have always, you know, I mean, at one point they were part of the Prussian Empire. They've always been connected. He was always fascinated with the idea of bringing Russia and Austria back together. Um, his father was a civil servant. They were not very close. There's always been debate whether his father and his grandfather may have been Jewish. There's no actual evidence of that. I think that's just, people just want that to be true, you know. Um, there's also always been debates whether he had a, a birth defect. Apparently he was supposed to have only had one testicle. Probably also not true. Uh, just something else that people have said to make him look really bad. I don't think you need to make him look bad. He does that himself already. Um, 
but he really was again obsessed with austria and germany coming back together he uh, wanted to be an artist this is actually one of his paintings he wasn't a terrible artist he just wasn't a good artist he was rejected by the university of vienna in austria there's always been debates what would have happened had they accepted them maybe the world would be different he went he goes ahead and moves to Vi vienna anyway what's interesting is there's not necessarily I mean, he wasn't really a very good student he was just kind of adequate at everything um there really isn't any evidence that he was especially anti-semitic at this point and this is an anti-semitic world uh in austria and germany they'd have a lot of anti semitism but they also had huge populations of jews as well um even in the government and and, and you know but but he didn't seem to be especially anti-semitic at least not yet not till after the war at this point in other words there was no guessing what he was going to become yet um he again was kind of a, a had kind of a weird overly moralist we don't he seems to have been very inept with women um again this is another thing people have often argued if he was better with women and, and and was in love maybe who knows but he was very chaste and kind of prudish and he thought of women in a very simplistic way that he kind of expected women just to be kind of pretty and dumb and, and not really involved in things again almost in a way i think a lot of young boys think of girls and and, and not in a mature grown-up way if you will um and really very little evidence that he ever really dated he did ultimately date a woman named ava braun and they married right before they killed themselves but even there there's not a lot of evidence that they actually maybe even had sex i mean again he just seems to have had a lot of issues you know emotional issues and development issues perhaps um he was he was not very well educated like i said he was kind of quite a crude person um and it's funny even after he was the supreme leader people kind of whispered at his poor table manners and and his very simplistic way of looking at the world um anyway uh, this is supposed to be a photograph of hitler at the de declaration of war in germany in 1914. Uh, most people think it's a fake photograph it's a real photograph but that most people think he's been added into this photo but you do see this often in documentaries and textbooks um he did fight the war he was not there's always rumors that some people say he was a great soldier other people say he ran away and there's no real evidence one or the other he seems to have been a typical soldier he does seem to have been what we call shell shocked today we call ptsd for a while um he seemed to have been maybe even temporarily blinded uh from the trauma but he was incredibly angry as were many germans uh at the outcome of the war and after the treaty of versailles many people in germany were looking for um somebody to blame and the argument was it was the jews the jews did it they stabbed us in the back uh, they control both the capitalist system but they also control the communist and socialist system and this was a very typical type of political cartoon you would see and here's this weird feminized version of a jew stabbing the german soldier in the back and unfortunately this was a widespread idea amongst many soldiers including uh hitler hitler stayed in the military it was more of a police force by this point he was supposed to infiltrate various revolutionary groups communist groups and socialist groups and things like that and one of these little groups was the nazi party the nationalist socialist party but and he was supposed to infiltrate it but he ended up liking this party he liked what they were saying this anti-semitic anti-immigrant um party that uh, wanted to bring back the glory of germany and ultimately hitler was kicked out of the army because it was clear that he wasn't infiltrating the nazis he was becoming a nazi and in fact ultimately rose up to be the leader of this nazi party and he idolized mussolini and after the march on rome he tried to do the same thing in germany he and several hundred nazis in 1923 marched on berlin the problem was he forgot that Mussolini had the king on their side. He didn't have anybody on his side. So they were thrown in prison. Um, he only spent about nine months in there, treated very well. Mostly uh, soldiers were the prison guards and they all liked him. And um, he ended up writing his book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, while he was in prison. Um, and then when he gets out, he decided we're not going to go down the revolutionary route. That didn't work. We're going to go down the political route so he he works very hard to convert this nazi party from a revolutionary party to a legitimate political party 
even though it still has all the elements of fascism, totalitarianism, use of violence, racial purity, all of that. But they are going to get elected to office. Now, what's interesting, Hitler himself never actually was elected to office. That's, that's a bit of a misnomer. You'll hear people say that. Uh, they, oh, they even elected Hitler to office. Never did. They did elect the Nazi party to office. And again, the Reichstag, the parliament of Germany, ultimately the Nazis become the majority party of the Reichstag. And at that moment, the president of Germany, so when Germany was at the end of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the Weimar Republic, as it was called, um, had a system where you had the Reichstag, the parliament, and then the leader of that would be the chancellor. And then you would also have an, an elected president that would kind of be just like our system. And so initially, uh, it was actually a different uh, president at one point. Um, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was, I was actually trying to cheat here and look for the guy's name and I can't find his name, doesn't matter. Uh, this guy, uh, Paul von Hindenburg was the second and last president of Germany. He was very old uh, by the time he appointed Hitler as chancellor. He was 84 years old. He'll die about a year later. Um, so in the 1932 elections, Nazi party clearly are the majority party. And with that, Hindenburg officially says, well, Hitler, I'm naming you the chancellor because your party is the majority party. And so um, he has a lot of powers, but not complete powers. And, but he wants complete power. So in early 1933, there's a major act of terrorism at the Reichstag, the parliament building. Uh, that's it rebuilt on the right, by the way. Um, there's a lot of debate over exactly what happened. The, the, the most common argument is that it was indeed uh, faked by the Nazis. And the reason we think that is because the fire was had barely started and we already see communications uh, between some of the Nazi leaders of, you know, go ahead and arrest these people. But there was a guy named von der uh, Lube who was a communist that that seems to have actually been involved in this. He ultimately was beheaded in, uh, a year later, 1934, 24 years old, just a young kid. Um, and what it seems to be is that the Nazi government was ready for something to happen. And the moment something happened, they elevated it, they magnified it. And so they get special powers that they get through the Reichstag, the idea we need special powers to deal with this, this communist threat. Uh, and so he becomes much more powerful. And then when Hindenburg died, they just never held another election. So in 1933, basically what ultimately happens is that Hitler becomes the fascist leader of Germany. Uh, in summer of 1934, in, a, in an event called the Night of the Long Knives, he has all his political enemies executed and sort of inadvertently ends up becoming uh, this totalitarian leader of Germany. The Fuhrer, the father, uh, again, it's all about me. I am the leader of this country. And again, as the world, including the US, is still in the depth of the Great Depression, Germany explodes as this economic powerhouse and it's bringing back the glory of Germany and uh, people are thrilled. And, and, and again, it seems to be they've been punished, but now they are victorious. And you see things like the Audubon, the very first highway system built in the world. Our highway system is based on that one. Things like the Volkswagen, the people's car was innovated under Nazi Germany. You have groups like Hitler's Youth, which is sort of their version of the Boy Scouts training this new army. But of course, it is a totalitarian fascist government. So you can't have individual thought. You have all, all your thought, all your beliefs have to be approved by the Nazis. So they really did hold book burnings. And as one uh, quote famously said, uh, a culture that burns books will eventually burn people. And of course, books that espoused communism and socialism, but also democracy, the Declaration of Independence, Mark Twain, who criticized racism, uh, were burned. So they, they believed in racial purity, the Aryan race is the pure race. Um, and that all other races should be subservient to the master race, if you will. Uh, and Germany will be the leader of this master race. And of course, Hitler would be the ultimate 
leader himself. And they did in place, uh, put in place uh, a Jim Crow, a segregation style of government. Uh, and it is true, they borrowed our laws, United States laws to, you know, they took our laws and basically changed them a little bit. And then it went a lot further. We're going to get more into this in part three. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to this racial component of what's happening in World War II later. Because these ideas about race and social Darwinism, sort of a climax, if you will, in World War II. So very, I'm going to go through a bunch of events very quickly. So uh, because of what Japan did in Manchuria, Italy goes, hmm, maybe we can do the same thing. So they invaded Ethiopia. Ethiopia was the one free nation in Africa. Um, they are invaded by Italy in 1935. Basically, uh, Ethiopia, again, goes all the way back uh, to the beginning of Christianity. One of the very first Christian churches ever organized is the Church of Ethiopia. Again, a, a culture with a deep history, uh, but with two colonies above and below it. Italy just invaded and like, like, like a vice crushed it and nobody did a thing to stop it. And of course, Hitler was watching that and went, hmm, maybe I need to emulate that. So an area known as the Rhineland. The Rhineland is there on the left uh, with the this, this slanted lines. This is an area set aside, carved out in Germany that was supposed to protect uh, the the France and Belgium and other countries from a German invasion. It's supposed to be this demilitarized zone. Well, Hitler decided we're just going to invade it, this French area. And he sent his soldiers in. By the way, Germany wasn't supposed to have an army. Uh, Hitler just starts building an army. And nobody stops him. He actually told his soldiers, uh, turn around if anybody stops you. Because he, he wasn't ready to start war yet. Nobody stopped him. Nobody stopped him. Nobody wanted war. Uh, he takes over the Rhineland. And this is when we start to see the very first executions, a genocide. Uh, a lot of the people living in this area were actually former German residents who were married to Africans uh, back when Germany had the colonies in Africa. And so there were a lot of African women living here, African Germans, uh, and a lot of mixed race children. And they were the very first people uh, Hitler executed. Uh, several thousand of them were, were slaughtered. And so they occupy it and people are furious, but nobody stops them. Then in 1937, Japan going, hmm, we already did Manchuria. No one's stopping Italy or Germany. Well, we're going to invade China, what's known as the Sino-Japanese War. And in particular, what happened in Nanking, which ultimately became the capital of China, you know, because it kept switching. So this, is a, so this also gets an issue of when does World War II begin? You know, does, does it begin, you know, we always say it's Pearl Harbor for the U.S., but but the, the classic definition is the invasion of Poland in 1939, but Japan invades Manchuria in 31, uh, Italy invades Ethiopia in 35, the Rhinelands invaded in 36, 1937, Japan invades China. This is World War II. It's just we don't call it that. So Japan decided to full on invade China. And some of the most brutal fighting in the war happens here. Um, again, Japan, Japan were basically Chinese uh, historically, uh, but they thought of themselves as racially superior to all other Asians. And some of the uh, uh, trigger warning, the next couple of slides are, are going to be some of the worst things you've ever seen. Maybe uh, we know that throughout Korea already there were these sex stations set up. Uh, women were, sex slaves were set up to serve Japanese soldiers. They began to also set these up throughout China and later what is now Vietnam. Uh, but as they rolled into China, uh, they absolutely demolished the people, particularly the, the nation, uh, excuse me, the city of Nanking. It becomes known as the Rape of Nanking. Um, they just gathered up hundreds of thousands of people and beheaded them publicly. Uh, they made a game of it. Newspapers report the numbers gleefully every day of how many of how many people were beheaded and their heads paraded around. Uh, women were raped and then beheaded and sometimes not in that order. And they glorified this. This is Japanese propaganda thrilled at what they were doing to the Chinese. Then on the other side, uh, 
Germany is like, you know what? Now we want the Sudetenland, which was a part of Czechoslovakia that was carved out of Japan. Excuse me, carved out of China. Good Lord, I'm sorry. Carved out of Germany, and they want it back. So they're they're getting ready to invade the Sudetenland. And at this point, France and England are going, oh my God, this is World War One starting all over again. What are we going to do about Germany? We've got to do something to stop Germany. So a conference was held to, 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 to try to handle this, to try to stop war. So again, they held a conference, uh, they being France and England and Germany and Italy. They got together, held a conference of how to deal with the Sudetenland. And Germany's argument was, that used to be ours. You guys took it from us. You shouldn't have taken it from us. We just want it back. We just want Germany back to the way Germany used to be. That's all we want. We don't want war. And so, uh, in particular, Prime Minister of England, a guy named Chamberlain, uh, Nigel Chamberlain, kind of ran this. And so you can see this conference and you can see the leader of uh, Chamberlain's way on the left. You can see Hitler and Mussolini right in the center. They made an agreement. They said, okay, we're going to give you the Sudetenland, but that's it. You don't get anything else. You know, if you do anything, like if you, because we know you guys want Poland back because Poland, part of that used to be Germany. You can't have Poland. If you invade Poland, that's going to be war. And Hitler, of course, said, yeah, 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 whatever. Okay, whatever. Not believing any of it. And when Chamberlain came back to England, he was cheered as a hero. He avoided war. He brought peace to the world. We don't, we're not going to have another world war. Today, he's been highly criticized for that, for appeasing Hitler. And of course, one of his main opponents was another English politician, a guy named Winston Churchill, who uh, very much criticized Chamberlain. To be fair, what could have, if, there's been a lot of debate, well, what could Chamberlain have done? Um, other than just go to war, it really is a tough decision. And at the time it did, I mean, even FDR sent him a telegram and said, good job. You know, it's easy in hindsight to be like, oh, can you believe he did that? But it, 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 it is hard to decide what else could you have done other than just go to war? Nobody was ready for war yet. England wasn't ready. Uh, and everyone's in a depression. This is, you know, so it did, it does look incredibly foolish today. And Chamberlain would always regret that particular photograph. And then, so the tanks roll into Czechoslovakia. And this is a very famous photograph. Some people, Germany always said, these are tears of joys are crying. Others said, no, obviously they felt they were being forced to be part of Germany again. And of course, what Germany argued, what Japan argued, is what the United States used to argue. Frederick Jackson Turner, that we need a frontier, we need breathing space. Lebensraum, as the Germans called it. Um, and that's, we just need breathing space. We have lots of people. We just need to grow. We need a frontier. You guys did it, United States. You know, you took over the Indians. Well, we're just doing the same thing. You said Indians are, are inferior to white Americans. Well, these people are inferior to us. We're no different than you guys. And again, by this point, it's clear. League of Nations is a joke. International strife, international war, the, the viper is doing whatever it wants. And the League of Nations is just a scared rabbit that can't stop it. Then Russia, remember them? They and Germany, two totally different political systems. They sign a pact. Because Russia wants to grow. They want Eastern Europe. Germany wants to grow. They have equal goals. So they decide to join together. The communists and the fascists sign an agreement that they will not go to war with each other. And with Russia basically saying, we won't stop you. We know you want Poland. We want Finland back and some other areas. Go for it. You take Poland. So with that, Germany invades Poland. The very thing they promised Chamberlain they would not do, they do it. September 1st, 1939, the official start of World War II. But again, as you can see, there's been fighting this entire decade before Poland was invaded.
they march in. They again, they, there was this ruse that the Polish did some act of terrorism. Nobody believed it, and Germany didn't even push that very far, uh, and Poland fell fairly quickly. With that, England and France declare war on Germany. And therefore, just like 1914, we are back in a world war again. Um, at the same time, um, Japan is already invading China. So there's this recognition that war is already happening in Asia. Now it's happening in Europe. It's a world war again. And throughout 39 and 40, Germany very quickly starts expanding. They start bombing London. They invade France. Russia uh, is also invading much of Eastern Europe. They start going into Finland, for instance. Uh, London, again, every night bombed. Uh, it's known as the London Blitz. By this point, Churchill was the prime minister of England. Chamberlain stepped down the moment Poland happened, uh, and he survived the war in this bunker at the bottom of London while London itself was being bombed. By 1940, France surrendered. Uh, again, ultimate victory for Hitler to totally uh, invert what happened in World War I. And of course, the terms of surrender for France happened where else? But that same train car that Germany had to sign the armistice back in 1918. And there is suddenly seems to be three countries really four if you add in Russia, but three countries seem to be all working together. The Axis powers. And in fact, in 1914, they sign a pact together. At this meeting, Germany, Italy, and Japan all agree that they're going to divide up the war, the world between them. Japan gets Asia, Italy will get Africa, and your and Germany will get Europe, including Russia, although they're not publicly making that known yet. And this is the actual agreement that they signed. This is the Japanese version of it. And Japan is thrilled, which is ironic because Japan thought that they were racially superior. The Germans thought they were racially superior, and the Italians thought they were racially superior. They all hated each other. But for the moment, they decided it was better to work together. And if, and if so, if Germany goes to war with a country, Japan and Italy will go to war with that same country. And if, so when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, uh, United States, Germany and Italy immediately declare war on the U.S. That's, you know, and that's what, how we're going to get involved in this war. And this is, again, how Japan portrayed this agreement. And with that, um, Hitler decided to invade Russia. The very country that they had just made an, an, a, a non-aggression pact with, and they turned right around and invaded Russia. This is one of the biggest mistakes ever in military history. You do not invade Russia. Russia is too big, too vast to do this. But Hitler wanted to do it because he wanted to do something and it's known as Operation Barbarossa. I'll come back to what's on this slide. I can't go backwards, but you'll see the slide in a moment or, or talk about it in a moment. But he wanted to do what Napoleon tried to do. Napoleon tried to invade Russia and failed. Hitler wanted to do the same thing and succeed. And at first, people thought summer of 41, he thought we're just going to blitzkrieg. I mean, it's lightning strike. We're going to blitzkrieg our way in. It's going to take them by surprise. And by winter of 41, we're going to have Russia taken. Stalin had no idea they were going to do it. His general said, uh, there's about 3 million, literally 3 million Germans on our border. Stalin said, oh, no, no, they're, they're here to help us. They're not going to uh, invade us. And that's exactly what they did in summer of 1941. Stalin actually literally locked himself in a room for about a week. He was in total shock. And then Russia started fighting back. Ultimately, 10 million Germans 20 million Russians will die on what is known as the Eastern Front. This is where most of the war happened in Europe, was actually in Russia. At that moment, Hitler lost the war. He just didn't know it yet. But summer 1941, we didn't know how it was going to end. And 
uh, the United States is not involved in this yet, but basically the Nazis have are pretty much in control of Europe. Uh, they're not in control of Spain, which is again on the bottom left, but Spain had an agreement. They were a fascist country under a guy named Franco. They had an agreement with the Nazis. Uh, in the middle, that's Switzerland. They were neutral, but they had an agreement with the Nazis. Uh, the only country really kind of independent basically was Great Britain. And they were they thought they were about to fall. So the United States is going to ultimately get involved, as we all know. And again, Japan was expanding. They had Korea, they had Vietnam, they were moving into India, they were moving into China, they already had Manchuria, and were probably going to move into Russia themselves. So and Italy was in Africa. The world is on fire and no United States yet. Part three, we'll finally talk about the United States and we'll talk about the war itself and the aftermath of World War II. Thank you guys.